Hello, everyone. Good to see you again, uh, November. Um, yeah, we changed this month because we recognize that this is a far more important discussion, and it, I'm really excited to get into it. I acknowledge that I live on the unceded territory of the Sinaiics and the Sequimac nations. Um, what's really neat about Indigenous people is that they honor the land itself, whereas typical European settlers tips, uh, honor a person. And I think we should think about how the world might be different, how climate change could be different, how land management might be different if we honored the earth as much, if not more than human life. It would be a way different battle that we'd be playing because we'd respect it so much more. So uh, today I'm excited to be speaking with Megan Julian, who is a Coast Salish daughter and a member of the Stalo Nation. And she works as the Indigenous Research Manager for Arch Archipel Consulting. And Megan will give us insights into Indigenous notions and concepts of the environment, as well as give us an Indigenous take on current Canadian environmental policy and how the next steps are about creating connections and relationships. So um, I'm really looking forward to this. She was going to share a presentation and enlighten us and educate us. And then there'll be a question and Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, kind of write them down or keep them to yourself or put them in the chat and then we'll, we'll get to them after her, her conversation. So. Megan, let's uh, let's pass this over to you and let's all sit back and learn some stuff. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Anik. Um, thank you so much for that intro. I just want to say hello to everyone and thank you for coming to this online session on Indigenous climate action. I cannot thank you enough for offering your most valuable and non-refundable resource to this topic, your time. And I hope that you walk away from this presentation and this conversation with new knowledge and new insights. Um, so before we get started, I just want to do a quick overview of where we're going to go. Um, we will start with a little introduction. I'll introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, we will talk about Indigenous conceptions about the environment. Indigenous perceptions and thoughts on Canadian current policy, um, as well as the actions taken by Indigenous environmental actors, and then ways moving forward to develop connections and continued relationships with Indigenous people and communities and organizations. So normally for any, um, conversation we would have with our Chappelle, we would start with having everyone um, situate themselves. But in the interest of time, I'm going to ask that maybe you guys, if you have a question, you can situate yourself and introduce yourself before you ask your question. So the work that we're doing with Indigenous communities is very reflexive process, trying to understand where you are, why you're there and how does your role impact those around you, especially when we're talking about this topic. So um, I invite you, hopefully we can put this in the chat, nativeland.ca and you can reflect on um, the territories within Canada that you might be residing on. But I will go further to introduce myself. Um, my name is Megan Julian. And as Greg highlighted, I'm an, the Indigenous Research Manager with Archipelago Consulting. I am a Coast Salish daughter and a member of Stalo Nation, which is located in the Lower Mainland BC. I am Indigenous, but I didn't grow up on reserve. I grew up in an urban environment. And my background is in urban planning and international development. And so that's the perspectives that I'm going to speak to you today. So let's move on to Indigenous conceptions of the natural world. So I think it's important to outline the differences between Western and Eurocentric uh, conceptions and Indigenous conceptions as a foundation for understanding the motivations for Indigenous actions for the environment. Um, I also want to preface this conversation saying that what I'm going to talk about is a very generalized description um, without acknowledging the differences between the various Indigenous peoples in Canada, such as the Métis, Inuit, or First Nations. 
but in the interest of times, these concepts have been generalized and I encourage you all to dig deeper into the various distinctions between these groups, as well as their perceptions of the environment, especially any groups that you might be located next to. So let's start with the Eurocentric worldview. So from a Eurocentric point of view, nature is something that is not human. It is understood as a wild and untamed space, a space that can be organized and sorted. The foundation of organizing wilderness is through ownership where land is divided up and put into different uses such as housing, parks, businesses, natural reserves. And these conceptions were brought to the land we know as North and South America through European colonization. And more specifically through the concept of terra nullius. Inherently within terra nullius is the principle that Christian peoples have the power to change and develop the land. They view that since the people of North America didn't have Christianity, they were not civilized and therefore could not claim use of the lands. Once an individual owned the land, they could then develop and profit from it solely and were entitled to do so. So in summary, we have the concepts of terra nullius, the central importance power of Christianity, the idea that land can be owned and that the elements of the environment are able to be separated. Um, on the other hand, we have indigenous conceptions of the natural world, where the natural world and the things within it have inherent power in and of themselves. The environment is understood as sacred beings that have agency on their own, apart from the interference or use of humans. So the parts of the natural world being sacred, they're viewed as kin to humans, where they take care of us by offering food, water, and air, and um, we must take care of them as well in a reciprocal relationship. So this reciprocal relationship is understood not just between humans and other parts of the world, but also between various different organisms and plants already existing and they're interconnected. So the emphasis here is on a reciprocal relationship and interconnectedness, which kind of construes the idea of having ownership of land. And it's not to say that indigenous peoples didn't have a concept of ownership of land, but often the ideas that existed were limited by a season and the benefits were shared throughout the communities. Moving on to the next topic, indigenous and environmental policy in Canada. So um, before we really dig into this, I just want to highlight the articles outlined within the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was accepted by the Canadian federal government this summer as to be um, eradicated into law, which is very exciting. Um, here I have Article 29, which is more specific about the role of Indigenous people in the environment. And then on the side here on the right, I have more um, of a summary of other, other articles. So I'm just going to read it out to you guys and as we move forward you guys can keep these articles and policies in mind. So article 29 states that Indigenous peoples have the right to the conservation and protection of the environment and the productive capacity of their lands or territories and resources. States, being Canada, shall establish and implement assistance programs for Indigenous peoples for such conservation and protection without discrimination. States shall take effective measures to ensure that no storage or disposal of hazardous materials, materials shall take place in the lands or territories of indigenous peoples without their free prior and informed consent. 
And states shall also take effective measures to ensure as needed that programs for monitoring, maintaining and restoring the health of indigenous peoples as developed and implemented by those people being affected. Article 24 addresses the protection of traditional medicines and plants. Article 25 addresses maintaining the spiritual relationships that, we, that I highlighted earlier with the land, as well as Article 23 asserts that states must consult with Indigenous peoples to obtain free prior informed consent before the approval of any project involving their lands, especially in connection to the use of minerals, waters, or other resources. What's important to note is that this article in UNDRIP refers to lands that are deemed Indigenous owned or traditional territory, which currently in Canada, many of those lines of ownership are still being drawn today, as well as they are contested. So moving on to the policies within Canada, this may be new for you or old news, but we'll just go over it in brief. So in Canada, there's two prominent climate policies. We have the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, which came out in 2019. And then we have a healthy environment, a healthy economy from 2020. So here I have a short summary, very short summary of the pillars of those climate policies in Canada. And they include carbon pricing, which is carbon tax and cap and trade, uh, use of green infrastructure, such as increasing renewable and non-emitting energy sources, improving energy efficiency in buildings, investing in public transit, protecting carbon sinks. For green economy, we have the investment in small and medium enterprises, foster, uh, fostering the production of cleaner fuels, investing in clean technology innovation, uh, climate resilience and adaptation, we have infrastructure again, but this is focused on mitigating the impacts of a natural disaster, such as, I don't know, fires or floods, um, as well as the use of traditional knowledge, traditional indigenous knowledge and science and putting those into actions. The protection, um, the protecting and improving of human health as well as supporting vulnerable regions and communities. And lastly, we have the nature-based solutions, which includes uh, land-based offsets, planting trees, restoring and enhancing west wetlands and allocating land to be used for carbon sequestration, which all of these sound great, but from an indigenous perspective, there's some differing thoughts. So when it comes to carbon pricing, from an indigenous perspective, this is also understood as a regressive tax scheme. It's a scheme that impacts those that have less access to income than those that have more access to income, as well as it doesn't acknowledge the already high costs of indigenous communities living in rural and remote areas. In addition, carbon pricing schemes tend to be handed over to the provinces and fails to offer the same option for Indigenous communities, therefore failing to uphold Indigenous rights and sovereignty to the use of their land. When it comes to green infrastructure, the concept of having more energy efficient transit is unlikely to reach communities that are rural or remote or Indigenous. Um, as well as the push for electric vehicles can often be inaccessible for many due to the costs or even finding the infrastructure to find a charging station. Um, and clean energy initiatives was found by a shared future research team report in 2019 often exclude indigenous communities. When it comes to the green economy, the idea put forth um, perpetuates the idea that as a country, we can continue to grow without impacting the climate, which is something that Indigenous people have an issue with, this idea of continuous growth. 
as well as it offers financial incentive for clean fuel development, which also already exists. Um, as well, it posits climate change as an issue that can be saved by technology rather than uh, changing the way that we operate as a country. And the use of clean tech and energy can also still have adverse consequences to the environment. Um, climate resilience and adaptation, indigenous people find that it fails to address why the specific regions that are vulnerable, uh, why are they vulnerable? What are the historic reasons for that? What is the source of that vulnerability? As well as indigenous people find that the use of indigenous knowledge is sometimes used in lieu of meaningful inclusion in decision-making processes. Um, and then the resilience narrative tends to focus on communities rather than industries or polluters as being the change. And lastly, I know I've been going on a bunch, uh, nature-based solutions. So this can be seen as a continued land grab for indigenous people which can restrict the livelihoods of indigenous communities, can lead to displacement, can impact our cultural rights and indigenous peoples, um, sorry, in the section for nature-based solutions, they cite that the role of indigenous peoples is integral and important, but as this report from indigenous climate action found, many of indigenous uh, indigenous peoples, rights, knowledges, and approaches to climate change were systematically excluded from the creation and implementation of these policies and plans. So what's important to know is that throughout these plans that the government put out, they continuously cite the important role of indigenous people without meaningfully including them in the process. Um, but this hasn't hindered the actions of Indigenous people to try to protect and preserve their land and the environment. So let's go on to Indigenous climate action. So I also want to note on this page that um, this is a picture of water protectors from Minnesota, which I note is not in Canada, but I really like the photo. I feel like it's very symbolic. And um, I think it's also important to remind us and acknowledge that there is Indigenous action for protecting the climate all over the world. And Indigenous communities are often on the front lines of environmental protection. I have a quote that I'm going to read you guys from Clayton Thomas Mueller, which is he's a Canadian Indigenous activist. And he says that if you lay out a map of all of the Métis hamlets and all the Inuit settlements and all of the 600 plus First Nations, and you put on top of that map the location of all of the extractive facilities, for the most part directly adjacent, they are all next to our communities. So this here is a timeline, I think it's a really interesting timeline. And I think, um, no, I think the work that indigenous people are doing is often overlooked. And I think that indigenous communities play a really key role because they understand the impacts very intimately. So here I have the names of the projects as well as their status and the communities that worked to try to stop the development of these extractive companies. So from last year, 2020, we have Tech Frontier Tar Sands was canceled due to the work of the Dene, the Cree and Treaty 8 territory communities. 2017, the Energy East oil pipeline canceled due to the, uh, this is where you see me also struggle with some of the pronunciations of indigenous communities uh, Wolastok Nation, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Kanesateke Mohawk, Iroquois Council, Assem and the Assembly of First Nations. 2016, the Northern Gateway Pipeline canceled with the help of the Yinka Dene Alliance. 
Pelt Sioux Nation, the Coastal First Nations in BC, and Wet'suwet'en First Nation. 2016, the same year, Trans Mountain Oil Pipeline canceled, canceled with the work of the Tsisili Watuth First Nation. 2015, Pierre River Tar Sands Oil Mine canceled with the Dene Cree and Metis. And the Wet'suwet'en First Nation has been continuously fighting the development of the coastal gas link pipeline since 2012. So um, really clearly active community of indigenous uh, people and organizations trying to protect their lands. So who's saying what? I just wanted to highlight some contemporary indigenous climate leaders. Um, interestingly enough, from the research that I've done, there seems to be a prominent influence of women climate leaders as opposed to men. They are out there, but across the board, there seems to be a lot of indigenous ladies taking the lead. Um, so here we have Sheila Watt-Coltier, she's Inuit. Um, I apologize, I didn't put all of their nations on here now that I see this. We'll try to um, remember at least where they're from. So she highlights that we need to understand climate change as a human rights issue and understand that there is a need for change on deeply human terms. Uh, Melina Labucan Massimo, she's from Alberta and she created a solar initiative in her community. And she highlights that climate change action must start with addressing the needs of those that are bearing the brunt of the environmental impacts. Makasa Looking Horse from Saskatchewan, also part of Six Nations. She worked to create a lawsuit against Nestle who was taking water from her community, saying that indigenous people of Six Nations should always be at the table when the health of our water is at stake. We should have a say about the permits and how our land is governed. And here on the bottom, we have Gitz Crazy Horse, and he raises awareness about the impacts of the oil extractive industries in Alberta. Um, and he says that he is here, we are here because the people, uh, people's lives are at stake and the environment is at stake. Um, in a recent interview I heard with him, he talked about how in his community, he has more deaths. It's more likely for anyone in his community to die from cancer than it is for there to be a natural death. Um, he also does a really funny tongue in cheek video that I'll try to share in the, um, the backup resources after this. So, Last section, support and connections and relationships. So here I put a picture of the red cedar tree. For me as Coast Salish, the red cedar tree is really important. The tree is seen as the protector of the forest and all of the interconnected roots keep the ground and soil together. So hopefully as we go forward, we can manage to be protectors of the forest and create interconnections between different communities and organizations. In that light, I have some organizations here that I want you guys to take note of, um, like this slide in the last one. It's just a handful of the people and organizations that are doing Indigenous climate action work um, that we can work with or get in touch with and try to help out. I'm just going to do a quick overview of what these organizations are and what they do. So starting with the Indigenous Environmental Network on the bottom left, they um, create alliances between Indigenous people to protect the sacred earth from contamination and exploitation by respecting and adhering to Indigenous knowledge and natural law. On the top left, we have Land Needs Guardians, where they protect areas, restore animals and plants, test water quality, and monitor the development of projects. Um, they also teach Indigenous people 
uh, with both indigenous and Western knowledge for data collection, water quality analysis, and they integrate the knowledge they learn from their elders to move forward. We have the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, where they are dedicated to advancing the role of Indigenous nations in deciding the future of traditional territories. Um, they uh, work for protecting the environment and creating Indigenous leaders. Then we have CIER, which stands for the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources, where they help to build in sustainable Indigenous communities and as well protect lands and waters. Um, then we have the First Nations Major Project Coalition down here on the bottom in the middle, um, where they work with both elected and hereditary chiefs to advance the shared interest of gaining ownerships of major projects taking place in their territories. And they believe that we can have economic, economic opportunities as well as being environmental stewards. And Indigenous Climate Action, they work to support Indigenous peoples and um, support Indigenous leaders and take part in the climate change discourse and create awareness. And last, we have Water First, which um, addresses specifically the Indigenous uh, water, drinking water crises, crisis in Indigenous communities. They educate and develop skills that are essential for testing and supporting clean water for communities to drink. So you guys can have those as a resource going forward. And lastly, we have ways to try to build or how to think about building connections and relationships with Indigenous people and Indigenous communities and organizations. So before we begin, it's important that a person or an organization such as PAL that wishes to engage with Indigenous peoples must develop a bit of cultural competency based on the local communities where you guys are situated from, um, as well as understand and uphold the rights through UNDRIP, which we discussed earlier, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And the rights of Indigenous people in Canada through Section 35 through the Canadian Constitution. And as you go forward to try to build these connections and relationships, just keep in mind that Indigenous communities are in a time of reclamation. We are trying to rebuild our governance structures. You could almost say that we're like in a renaissance time at the moment, trying to rebuild and regrow. And that means holding space for understanding the experiences, listening and reflecting on what people are saying and learning from that, as well as celebrating and partaking in revitalization of indigenous communities and culture. And here I have um, just like a cycle for maintaining a relationship, a meaningful relationship. And so you have to build that relationship you have to manage and maintain it and then also have critical reflection, which we talked about earlier, placing yourself, understanding what your role is, and then also sustaining that relationship and seeing where it can go in the future as something, it's not like a one and done type of initiative. It's something that is collaborative and continuous. So in summary, um, I'm smiling because I managed to stay mostly on time. Uh, it's critical to establish true partnerships with Indigenous nations and organizations. And like I said before, remembering the rights through UNDRIP and Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, as well as when policies are put forward, promote climate solutions that account for the realities, the lived realities of indigenous communities and make sure that they're included because often they're forgotten as well as raise up and echo the voices of indigenous leadership. Um, yeah. so thank you guys so much. Have my email address here. If you guys wanna send me a question later or any thoughts, I'd love to hear it. 
and we can open the floor for questions further. Thank you so much. Wow, Megan, thank you very much for that. I talked a lot. I covered yeah, no. a lot. <laughs> well done. Take a little breather, drink some water. But yeah, I guess definitely it, I was a, a buddy and I were texting back and forth that were listening to you. And it was definitely depressing seeing how those policies that we all kind of feel so good about really are hard to access your communities and everything. How they almost, like you said, they exclude them a bit. And that was definitely, definitely a reality check for us. Um, yeah, thank what, you. Yeah, one of my questions for myself is I've been, I've had this dream of trying to connect with the community up in Baffin Island. And I, you know, before COVID, I was felt like I was starting to get somewhere. But like, if someone like me wanted to, you know, work with one of those um, organizations you mentioned and do something up in Baffin Island, like how, what, what would I do? How would I do that? <laughs> it's probably a long question, but. Yeah, well, I think, I think the organizations that I put forward would be a great place to start. I think um, you also, there, there comes that reflection of like, what is the goal of connecting with those communities and finding another organization or other people that have common goals. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, seeing where your goals can work and align with each other and then try to go from there. Because if you guys have common goals, then I'm sure you guys can help each other out. Yeah, that's sort of what I was seeing is that I've got a, you know, a platform and, and connections in the whole outdoor world and I wanted to go adventure up in Baffin Island, but yet I wanted to bring something back to the communities up there instead of just coming and taking and I was trying to exactly like, you know, help them develop some solar panels or, you know, energy infrastructure because that's something I'm interested in, but yet mm -hmm. on one side do my selfish mountain adventure, but spend an equal amount of time trying to do good while I was there. So yeah, it'd be great to look at those organizations and see if I can, because you've kind of re-inspired, yeah. even re-inspired that idea a bit, because I kind of felt like it hit some walls and then COVID changed a bunch, but uh, I'm definitely going to put it back on, on my front burner now. Mm -hmm. And like, I definitely find also with the work that I've done doing urban planning and learning about development, sometimes the communities you want to connect with don't want to do what you do and you have to be prepared to accept that that might be an option and that's okay also because they're doing what they need to do um so. yeah absolutely i felt like the first part would be to go up and just kind of listen instead of because i have no idea what they need or want really you know i've got these perceived ideas but they're probably not based on reality so yeah um yeah thanks yeah. for helping me clarify that idea does anybody in the chats want to throw out some questions for Megan? Um, but so also the, all those organizations, those are all Canadian uh, based or are they international across the border, North American? Uh, I think the Indigenous Environmental Network. Let's see here. Because I imagine your borders are different than ours. So yeah, are these North American? Yeah, most of these are Canadian based. I think the in Indigenous Environmental Network is broader, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, all, most of them are all Canadian based. Maybe Indigenous Climate Action also is broader, um, but most of them, yeah, based in Canada. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, and then regarding those policies, I mean, you mentioned like as POW Canada or as individuals, as our how how can we help make sure that the next versions of those policies help include you a bit more? Is there anything on our end that we, you know? Um, that is a great question. I wish I think it's just advocating and echoing the voices of Indigenous communities, and then if you have the opportunity to invite them to the table, do it. Um, identify the communities that you're close to and um, yeah, make sure that they get a seat at the table, talk to your local governments. Yeah, it's an interesting one because there's a development, a new ski hill development in uh, central BC going on. And, and from their website, it appears that they've, you know, talked with indigenous groups and, and they had, but it was kind of like this broad overreaching group. And that in fact, there's, uh, I've got them notes here, I have to look it up. 
there it's these autonomous Sinaiacs that were separated from the border and they stayed in Canada and then Canada said that they were actually extinct and then so they they've, they're slowly gaining a voice now but it was almost like this ski resort that's trying to implement itself like talk to this bigger bigger group when in fact they should have been talking right to these autonomous Sinaiacs so mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely a very muddy thing for us to to look into it's it's challenging yeah for sure definitely and another thing that's interesting actually that i forgot to point out is that if you are interested say there's like a specific development happening oftentimes like from the communities that i talked about in the timeline if you go to their website um they'll have I can't guarantee all of them, but lots of them will have maybe like a timeline of their involvement with pushing against that project. They'll have um, environmental studies that they've done on their own independently, um, and they'll have positions on that. So like if you are questioning some sort of development that's happening next to you, um, and you're trying to look it up online through like CBC or something, you're not finding anything and you think that it's not necessarily what's happening. If you look up the websites of the communities next to it, they'll often be very vocal about what's happening. And that's another resource that also just doesn't come to the top of your Google search. Mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, we mentioned these resources. Are we, we'll send them out an email afterwards or are we gonna put them in the chat? Meaning. Yeah. Hey, Greg and Megan, thank you. Um, you did hold, you did stay in your 30 minutes. That was amazing. <laughs> um, and yes, absolutely. All the resources um, that Megan shared today, we're going to send them out um, in the follow-up email and we'll have them on our website as well. Yeah, it's really great, Megan, because for a lot of us, it we're scared to even step foot into this arena because we're so scared of seeing the wrong thing and being you know who knows but i i kind of agree with what you said is, is we've kind of researched a bit more we can start kind of advocating for the right things and and all these resources you gave us will hopefully help us be a bit more clear and how we do it properly mm -hmm. definitely um i do have a, a question and if anybody else has any questions and wants to put them in the chat we can read them out or feel free to pop your camera on or come off mute and um, ask yes, your question. <laughs> See your beautiful faces. <laughs> but Megan, you talked about sort of upholding the rights. And I guess that's just general when you were showing the different government policies. And I had the same when you were talking uh, reactions as Greg had when you said green infrastructure and, you know, not, not um, being accessible to Indigenous communities. You know, that's a lot of that is at government level. So as the citizens, is it the same channels like letter writing and just paying attention and using our voices? Is that the best? Like, what can we do? Because I see that and I'm like, ah. Yeah, um, that's interesting and interesting point. So I didn't talk about it and I don't actually have it up, but the, like uh, Indigenous Climate Action, they have a book out that is um, basically a series of conversations with Indigenous leaders. It would be a great resource. I haven't read it. Um, I imagine it would be interesting to read, but all of the proceeds from that book goes directly to the work that they're doing as well as um, I know that a couple of the different organizations have like petitions, um, other workshops that you guys could get involved in that could be something you could do today to participate mm -hmm. in and try to support. And also any of those um, people that I highlighted, if you follow them, they are very active and share their thoughts and what's happening within their communities. And you can, you know, reshare and echo and share the knowledge that maybe isn't necessarily being put into the media. Amazing. Especially because for a lot of these topics, Indigenous communities are seen as like being stubborn resistance to progress, which not necessarily the case, but we tend to be portrayed in a specific way. Um, so changing the narrative is also really important. 
Thank you. That was great. <laughs> well, any other questions? It seems like you've probably just stumped us all and now we all need to go back and research more. <laughs> I've scared everyone away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, it's really great to get your perspective. Thank you. Um, um, and not at all, Megan, you've, um, and anyways, for myself and our organization, you've, you've definitely inspired us to do more, that's for sure. So thank you. No problem. Absolutely. It was a complete pleasure. And like I said, I'm so happy for everyone to just take the time out of their day to listen to what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all about connections. It's about connections with nature and connections with, with each other that are, make the world a better place. So I think we can all work on those. Definitely. Okay, well, shall we... Maybe in the last if, <laughs> yeah, if there if there are no more questions, I guess we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, we'll say thank you to everyone for joining us today because super, super important topic um, that we will keep following and keep having conversations. Um, that's for sure. Yeah, and don't forget the monthly reflections at the end of the month, which are a good time to kind of take what you've learned here and and put pen to paper and obviously there's those prizes to win but it's really about the reflections and how we can be better so so thanks again megan great thank you so much thank you everyone see you next month thank you bye